But Alistair will be taking us through chapter 12. So I've got a small, uh, small portion of that should pop up on the screen now. And uh, so this is part of the passage that he'll be covering. So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Thanks. So, yeah, a uh, pretty interesting passage. Again, uh, plenty of throwbacks to the Old Testament there as well that Alistair will be taking us through later on. So looking forward to that. Hebrews. We're, we're back in Hebrews. And I guess fair to say Hebrews has been a bit of a marathon. Uh, but we're just getting to that stage at the end of the race now, you know, where they, they get off the road and they've got to do the last couple of laps around the stadium before the end of the, the, end of the race. Um, uh, and that comes in that um, first bridging passage that between what Matt was uh, talking about last week and what we're talking about today. The great cloud of witnesses. Gosh, we, stadiums are sort of on the mind this weekend, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and there they are, all not just watching us, but uh, encouraging us. The great cloud of witnesses. Um, the, the, the passage that Matt read from um, chapter 11 last week is all those great heroes of the faith. By faith, this chap did this, and by faith, somebody did it. The heroes of the faith. Um, and now the rest of the letter says, given all that, therefore, uh, how should we then live? And the rest of the letter is about um, how we should live. But we maybe just need a, a little bit of recap because it's been a long story with Hebrews. Remember that it was written to a, dupe of, a group of Jewish Christians, probably living in Rome, um, who were tempted to slip back from the Christian way, as they called it with a capital W, the way, to back to Orthodox Judaism for a couple of reasons. One was that they were being um, oppressed by their Jewish brothers and sisters, who says, come back to the true faith. And the other was that Rome did not sanction the way Christianity is an official religion. So they're being persecuted by the Romans as well. So the writer is giving a long and detailed argument to persuade these Jewish Christians that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish story, that he's completely adequate to replace that endless loop of law, sin, sacrifice that just went on and on and on through, through Judaism. And times were hard for these guys. Um, they were facing that hostility both from their own um, racial group and also from the Roman authorities. That's the context. Um, and we go on now to how we should live. And I have to say, it's, it's tough stuff for us today. It's about discipline. The writer jumps straight in. He says, in your struggle against sin, you, and there's been a little bit of a theme here already this morning about uh, the group, okay, about unity. And one of the problems with English is when you say you, you can't tell whether it's singular or plural. You can't tell that one person's being addressed or many people are being addressed. That's why we should reinstate the wonderful Australianism of yous. And it is yous here. In your struggle against sin, yous have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He's talking to the group uh, of Christians in Rome. Um, the, the struggle word there, and there's a lot of athletic and sporting metaphors in this chapter, the struggle word could be translated as wrestling. You're, you're, you're in a wrestling match against sin. And the sin that's being talked about is not so much the sin of the Jewish, uh, the, the, these Christians, as the sin of the Jewish people who were trying to force them back into Judaism. 
And the writer is, is looking forward and saying, things are tough and they are likely to get tougher. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, but maybe it's going to come. So the readers could well be saying to themselves, why is this happening to us? We're doing the right thing. Why is God letting this, uh, this tough stuff happening to us? And it's a, a common response for us. When times are hard, we say, why? Why is this happening? It is important to remember that we are not promised a primrose path uh, in our faith. There's not some sort of reward of a good life that we're given for following Jesus. There's no promise that there won't be uh, tough stuff. So he goes on to say, have you and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. Quote, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. The quote comes from Proverbs. Now, the readers would have known it. Um, they might have conveniently forgotten it. Um, but ignoring or making light or losing heart over God's discipline misses the important point that God disciplines his children. But we really need to ask ourselves, well, why does he do that? On Fridays, um, our son Hugh uh, comes to us because Annabelle goes to youth club on Friday after school. And we sit and we have a beer and we discuss the world's problems and sort out most of them. Um, but just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Hugh was not his usual bright and cheerful self when he came home uh, because he'd had a particularly torrid day with one student who was determined to repeat something that had done him serious harm in the past and he wouldn't listen to reason. So in the very unusual circumstances, Hugh was um, forced into one of those two circumstances where he's allowed to use physical force um, to wrangle the kid. You know, when they're harm to themselves or harm to others, that's when you can use physical force. I hate you and all the teachers, he said, which would have taken Hugh uh, to the core, I think. Hugh's analysis was that this was a child whose parents allowed him to do exactly what he wanted to do, even when that might lead to him hurting himself. And it wasn't just climbing trees we're talking about here, no details. And incidentally, God bless all school teachers. It might seem blindingly obvious that parents must discipline their children for their own safety and good. But it does seem to me, and maybe it's increasingly, and maybe I'm becoming a grumpy old man, that an awful lot of people these days think that the priority is for the child to be happy. Happy. Even if that means torturing goldfish, or your small siblings, or your classmates, or putting yourself in harm's way. So long as you're happy, everything's good. And that's just kids, of course, isn't it? We're all grown ups and mature with a perfect sense of right and wrong. We don't need any of that discipline, do we? No. And it's a curious thing, but actually God doesn't discipline us in that corrective way. God will let you do, actually, just whatever you want to do. Think about that. You know, our conscience might prick us at first. Um, there might be some consequences of our actions, uh, but we're free to do what we like. Now, I suppose our parents were delegated authority from God to correct us. The law is a delegated authority that corrects us. Uh, the church, leadership of the church is a delegated authority that corrects us. But God doesn't actually stop us from doing stupid stuff. And in most circumstances, he doesn't punish us for doing stupid stuff. There are a couple of examples. Ananias and Sapphira, you remember, they, they fell over dead because they, they didn't contribute. Um, the Corinthians were talked about being sick because they were um, abusing the, the communion service. But I think those are exceptions. By and large, we're free to do what we like. And the sort of discipline that um, the writer of the Hebrews is talking about here is not that sort of corrective discipline. Remember the context again, hard times for these Jewish guys um, in, from their own community and from the Roman authorities. They were suffering through no fault of their own, times were hard, and they were being encouraged to think of it as a good thing, for goodness sake. The writer goes on, endure hardship as discipline. 
God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It is tempting to say, oh, well, those were different days. They were days when fathers had complete authority over their families, um, even to the extent of capital punishment. A father could kill a child um, if they wanted to without rebuke in those days. It was rare, but it was possible. We do tend to um, parody uh, character building these days. Calvin suffers a lot of, can you read that, Cheryl? Is it too far away? You can't. Ta-da, here we are, says Father. Good old itchy island, the home of the nuclear mosquitoes, says Calvin. Yeah, but bugs build character. Yes, and last year you said that diarrhea builds character. <laughs> Think what a fine young man you're growing up to be if all this character doesn't kill me first. That reminds me, open the duffel bag and get out the spam. And Calvin says, if the canoe isn't here in the morning, it means Hobbes and I have struck out for home. <laughs> I couldn't resist one more. Honey, have you seen my glasses? I can't find them anywhere. I haven't seen them. Calvin, go do something you hate. Being miserable builds character. Dad says, oh, the voice was a little funny, but that's still one darn sarcastic kid we are raising. <laughs> There's a lot of life in Calvin and Hobbes. I'm, I'm a great fan. But are we actually doing our kids any service by uh, allowing them or, or, or making their lives as easy as possible? It's true, isn't it, that life beyond the family or life beyond school will not always be easy. So we are laying a good foundation for our kids if we discipline in the sense of this, pas this passage. Not the corrective discipline, but the sort of discipline that means not randomly laying into them with a belt, but uh, perhaps insisting on chores at the expense of doing something more pleasant. Not always running to correct their mistakes. I warned you to take a rain jacket. Or letting them deal with difficult circumstances um, themselves. In other words, not hovering over them, helicopter parent all the time, to, to um, save them from every difficult situation. Life's going to be difficult. There are going to be difficult situations. Um, childhood is a time when we can learn how to deal with it. There are some important metaphors in that, that longish section we just read. Um, and the first one is in verse 8. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. The, the, the Roman context was of the extended family, the pater familias, which means, just means father of the family. In the Roman times, at least I guess in the sort of middle and upper classes, meant not just the nuclear family, you know, mum, dad, and the kids. It meant mum, dad, the kids, the slaves, the concubines, the slaves' kids, the concubines' kids, could be quite an extended um, group. Now, the father, there he is nobly in the front there. Um, he would uh, discipline um, the bearer of the family name, perhaps that, the, the one on the, uh, on the left there, he's got his hand on the shoulder. But then there are these other children here, um, of, of dubious parentage, let's say. They might belong to the concubine or the slave. Uh, the, the father of the family wouldn't bother with them. They weren't going to carry the family name. They were just illegitimate children. They would go up to be more concubines and more slaves. So uh, God, who is an infinitely better father than the, the paterfamilias in Rome, cares deeply about his children. And so we get character building experiences. We get trained up. Um, 
And I guess when you look back, I hope, you're um, actually grateful to your parents who showed us that disciplines of cleanliness, tidiness are valuable, and that a bit of perseverance when times are hard works well. And verse 11 implies a couple of other things which are not pleasant at the time, which bear fruit later. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. We were hacking trees to bits in, in um, Edna's garden yesterday. Uh, it's not pleasant, you know, zzz, zzz, zzz with a chainsaw, and bits of bark get ripped off, it's, it's crude. Uh, but for the fruit tree, it produces a greater fruit later on. And of course, nobody expects training on a cold winter morning um, to be pleasant. But on the other hand, if you don't train, the results on match day uh, will be poor. So stuff that's hard now bears fruit later. And that, the, the, the trained word in there is another of these um, athletic metaphors. You know, he, the writer was playing on people's sense of sport uh, as it was in those days. So, toughen up, says the, the writer. Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. I sometimes think the coach at half time says nice stuff to the players. It's all right, chaps, you're doing really well. Said, Did you hurt your leg? It will be out, just press on. Um, I'm sure that it's exactly what Ron Barassi said to his, uh, his teams every time, you know. It's going to be tough, but it will be worth it. That's what the coach says. And that's what, what really what the writer is saying here. He's saying that the, the sort of discipline that's being talked about is, is not being smacked with the belt because you did something wrong. It's, it's learning to cope with hard times and coming through those hard times a better person. Just a, a couple of words of caution, I think. Again, to repeat that, that what the, reader, the writer is talking about here is a communal attack on the church. So we're talking about communal hardship. Um, I, I don't think we have, as a church, have any idea what it's like to be a persecuted church. You know, there are persecuted churches in the world where just coming to church is dangerous, uh, where we would do it in cellars and behind closed doors and in the dark. It's nothing like that for us. But that's the sort of hardship and suffering that, that um, the writer's talking about. And um, I think that's, it's, it's more that sort of uh, hardship he's talking about than individual hardship. We are so individual these days. I don't think we have any idea, or much anyway, of the communality that people felt in those days when you, know, you didn't have Instagram and Facebook and all those things that encourage us to be individuals all the time. And if we are thinking about, about uh, suffering and, and hardship at the individual level, I think you should probably draw a distinction between hardship and suffering. Um, I, I don't think we would think, for example, of, of disease, of cancer or something, as God's discipline. Um, it's a different sort of um, state of affairs than, say, suffering from a natural disaster or being ostracized by your workmates because you're a Christian. Um, that's the sort of, of, of hardship that's being talked about. But the writer moves on um, to instruction and encouragement, and some of which we're going to have to skim over if we're going to complete this chapter. But just briefly, these verses here. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be, be holy. Um, challenging. We've got to be holy on the one hand, which is to be slightly set apart from the world. But on the other hand, we've got to live in peace with all the people that we deal with. Um, that can be challenging. Um, we have to interact with the world, but there's no place for Christians to be aggressive or abrasive in our, our dealings with the world. Uh, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Heaps that you could say about bitter roots. But the thing about bitter roots is to get them out of the ground as quickly as possible, not to let them become established, not letting the sun go down on your wrath, 
It's a pretty good principle there. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. Yeah, okay. Or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance and rights as the oldest son? What does that mean? Um, Esau rejected um, his, his spiritual inheritance for the sake of the fact that he was really hungry. Uh, he hadn't got a, a, an idea of what was significant and what was important. But I really want to move on to that final um, picture, the one that, that Matt read out. Maybe I'll read those verses again while you look at those pictures. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or such a, word, spe such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. This is Mount Sinai, the giving of the Ten Commandments of the law. Um, everybody had to stand back from the mountain. There was all this drama. Um, trembling Moses goes up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone. But you have come to Mount Zion to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's another of these comparisons, and there's so many through Hebrews, between the old way, the old Jewish way, and the new Christian way. Only, only Moses could even touch Mount Sinai. Only he could go up to the top. But Mount Zion is for everybody. We can all go, we can all join uh, that throng. I've just read again um, C.S. Lewis's well, it's a dream, and it needs to be taken as a dream. It's, it's Lewis playing with the idea of, of what might happen at the gates of heaven. Um, the story starts in a place that might be hell, uh, and the people who live there get a chance to visit the outskirts of heaven by bus. Yes, by bus. You'll have to read the book. To, uh, they do go by bus. But the point is that there they meet on the outskirts of heaven, really what we read just in that um, last verse. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. They actually meet people from their old lives who try to give them the opportunity to finally repent and, and off, take what God offers them. It's a good story, well worth reading. We're very privileged that it's Mount Zion that we come to, not Mount Sinai. It's the work of Jesus that makes us able to do that. But perhaps we shouldn't be too comfortable because as we walk the road to the kingdom, you can fall off on either side. You can fall off on the side of the flaming mountain, which is all about rules and the pain of punishment. Or you can fall off on the side of Mount Zion where you start to take grace for granted and become so comfortable that we neglect the sort of self-discipline that's required to live morally well. And coming to the end of the chapter. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. This is back at Mount Sinai again. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. God shook the world as the law was given. And um, it's actually Haggai, the prophet, I'm sure you all read Haggai every day, um, who, who gives that quote, and, and uh, here it is from Haggai 2, chapter, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Now it's apocalyptic talk. Uh, and so you know, we're hard to work out in a literal sense. But I think the meaning is about a final sifting 
of what's left, to sift out the bad, to leave the good, which will be uh, the heavens, the final um, thing that cannot be shaken anymore. <laughs> but even as I, I write that, when I say don't take it literally, I, I feel the tendency that I have, and maybe you do too, to play down God's awesome power and his holiness. There is this dreadful temptation to assume that God is just a kindly old uncle who will say, it's okay, I forgive you, um, and who will look over, overlook all of my failings and rebellions. The chapter finishes with a serious corrective. The, the God of Mount Sinai and the God of Mount Zion is the same God and the one to whom we should be thankful and worship with reverence and awe. There's the, the earthquake, the shaking, um, as it might be. But it was that last verse I wanted to, fo to focus on. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, when all the bad stuff has been shaken out of it, what remains? And that's something to be hopeful and look for forward to. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for, end of the chapter, our God is a consuming fire. Not a kindly old gentleman. Not only a kindly old gentleman. He is partly a kindly old gentleman, but he is also a consuming fire. Let's pray. Father, we've tried to think already today about who and, and what you are. Father, we could only deal in, in images that we can cope with in our brains. We thank you that Jesus is part of that image uh, and that, that fatherhood, good, strong, disciplining fatherhood, is also part of that image of who you are. Uh, Father, as we live this easy, easy life that we have, uh, when things go wrong in the way, or, or, or when things become hard, as they are for other Christians in the world, help us not to throw up our hands in despair, uh, but to accept hardship uh, as we accept training uh, on the grounds that you, our heavenly coach, promise us that, that in the end, um, we will be better for it. Uh, and the match will be won. Um, we thank you for all these images and pictures that, that help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen.